I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours, and then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability, as well as its robust interior, are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Today on the James Altucher Show. You just listened to part one about Nobel Prizes, imposter syndrome, and Barry Barish, and then Brian and I tell our stories. We get a lot more in depth into what makes someone the best in the world at something. And is imposter syndrome a part of that? What other characteristics are part of that? More stories about Nobel Prize winners and four stories about physics, chess, comedy, all sorts of other good things. And we talk about peak performers in every area of life. But this also starts a series which is going to get much more in depth into the a dozen or so theories on how did the universe begin? We'll release maybe one of these episodes every other week or so, and we have a couple of them. This is the first in that series, so I hope you enjoy it. Keep an eye out. And if you like these episodes, review the podcast. It always helps me. Or email me at altitude@gmail.com if you uh, have other questions about the Big Bang and I'll, uh, or, or, or other theories of how the universe began, and I'll ask uh, Brian in future episodes of this. Enjoy part two of... Nobel Prizes and Imposter Syndrome, and uh, we'll see you soon. As stand up, you wouldn't believe the like, he got, you know, people will say to each other, he got a Netflix special, he's on Jimmy Fallon. He, he, why is he on the stage now? I, oh, okay, I'll tell you a story. This is related to, so there's this comedian, Rich Voss, super funny comedian, mm-hmm. really love his Damn. stuff. He was one time at Stand Up New York and uh, he had just won a show, Last Comic Standing, and um, he had just won and he was performing at my club, Stand Up New yeah. York. And, uh, and they gave him, after 15 minutes, they gave him the light, which means it's time to get <laughs> off the stage. And he's like, are you kidding me? I am the best comedian here by far. I just won last comic standing. You're telling me I'm getting the light? This is ridiculous. This is outrageous. And he stormed off the stage and he saw who was coming onto the stage, Jerry Seinfeld. (laughs) So, you know, there's always that next person. And then he probably felt like, well, am I just over, you know, there's Jerry Seinfeld. I'm I'm, I'm never going to be him. He might be thinking that like, so there's always maybe the na- a nature of success. There's this famous Talmudic parable. This rabbi named uh, Rabbi Zusha has a dream that he goes up to heaven 
And they say to them, uh, uh, well, you know, they're kind of doing the accounting on your soul that is said to happen when you get to heaven after 120 years. And in his dream, you know, the angels ask him, you know, what did you do? And he apologizes. I was not like our teacher Moses. I was not like this guy Rashi or this guy that, you know, and they're like, you missed the point. You know, like you should have been Rabbi Zusha. Like, were you the best version of yourself? It sounds kind of trite, but I guess- No, but that's interesting. I guess, you know, to break down, like, wh who are you? I, in my book, make the point that it's actually who you are is what you do outside of the laboratory. Like, there is similarity between stand-up comics and great physicists. I mean, we both perform. Any professor has to be good at performing. You have to be a salesperson, which is, I think, you know, probably my strongest skill is that I can uh, you know, kind of sell an idea, sell a concept- recruit a team, but there are no manuals on how to do this. And that's one of the things I asked this guy, Barry Barish. I mean, in some sense, they said, you know, the joke was that he won the Nobel Prize for project management because it wasn't his original idea to build this antenna. He didn't come up with a theory. That was a guy named Albert Einstein or something like that, some nobody. <laughs> and it wasn't his idea to even, you know, get the original fun. He just saved it when it was looking like it was going to get canceled. And he built it up came through with the ideas, and then he left the project to do something else. So by the time he won the Nobel Prize, he had been gone for years thinking about his next big project. And that is something that we do. And I remember asking him, I'm like, give me the hack. Give me the Nobel Prize hack for my book. You got to give it to me for uh, Think Like a Nobel Prize. And he's like, there is no hack. Like, it's a discipline. You have to acquire like an apprentice, and you have to learn from mistakes, and you have to do, as you keep mentioning, experiments. And as you brought up, which is very important, you have to you have to have a certain charisma. You have to brand yourself as something special. Like Einstein, he has that characteristic brand where he was eccentric and his hair and you know, there's all these stories about him. Violin and bicycle. Richard Feynman playing the bongo drums and picking locks. And even Higgs Boson, it like just sounds cool. Like, yeah. oh, they found the Higgs. No the one God knows what the Higgs Boson no, no. particle is. The God yeah. particle. That's what it was right. called. The God particle. What else? It sounds like that. Yeah, that's good PR. So, so, so how does Barry deal with this imposter syndrome or does he? Well, he's in his 80s now. What's so interesting about him is that, um, so he's at Caltech. He's won the Nobel Prize. Uh, what does Caltech do? You know, this technical, small technical college in, in Pasadena. Do? They say, uh, you can't teach anymore. You're, you're too old to teach. We don't want you to teach. And so he says, okay, fine. You know, F you. I'm going to go to UC Riverside where his son works. He got a teaching position. This guy doesn't need the money. But what is his core? What is his essence? He's a teacher. And I hope when people listen to the episode, this episode of Into the Impossible, which is going to be my 100th episode. I can't wow. believe it. I've done 100 episodes with nine Nobel Prize winners and plus other standouts like James Altucher, <laughs> uh, Jordan Harbinger, Noah Kay, all these great podcasters. It's been, that's the thing. It's like, what is, people keep asking me, like Eric Weinstein, who's been on the show many times, he keeps saying like, what is, what do you want to do? Like, what are you doing with your podcast? And I keep coming back. I'm having fun. Like, he wants it to be like, is it going to be something about the theories of physics? Or is it going to be something about politics and the dark web? And the, No, his is like that, and that's his brand. For me, it's like, one day I'll have on a stand-up comic. The next day I'll have on a Navy submarine commander. But I am trying to pull together, like, what makes these people remarkable? And what can I learn to kind of optimize my life? Because the thing that keeps hanging over me I don't know if you know this, the, the Sword of Damocles. Do you know the parable of the Sword of Damocles? Uh, I've heard it, but I don't know. I don't remember it. It's actually pretty cool. I think it's like a peasant is talking to a king and is like, king, you could never live a day in my shoes. And the king's like, um, okay, we'll do it. I'll live as a peasant and you live as a king but uh, be for one day. But because you can't possibly experience all the emotions of being a king, whereas I can experience most of the aspects of being a peasant, I'm going to have a huge sword that's going to be suspended over your head by a human hair. And the slightest breeze could knock it off. Why? Because, A, they're under threat of assassination all the time, right? There's an evil period. And to have the pressure of, like, one false move is amplified and levered so much that it has this impact on the peasant himself, whereas there's nothing the peasant can do except assassinate the king, you know, that could possibly impact it. So I feel like, I feel like I have a sword of Damocles hanging over my head. I've, I've always felt like, you know, the Talmud says, you know, repent the day before you die. And you're like, okay, I, wait a second. <laughs> you know, I don't know when I, actually, I always want to ask you this. Would you want to know when you're going to die? Uh, yeah, I feel in all cases, information is power. So for instance, 
if there's articles about a movie I want to see, and spoiler alert, I always read it mm -hmm. because the more information, the better off I will be. Which, by the way, just as a, I know we always go on to small tangents, yeah, yeah. but this is related to inside information in the markets. I think it would be interesting as, if inside information was legal because you want a market to have as many facts baked into it as possible. So then the price of an asset will actually be the true price. So mm -hmm. the more information, I have basically the more I will be me, just like the mm -hmm. stock market will be more accurate. The more I will be, the more my knowledge will be accurate about the state of the world. Ah, so maybe we could have more of a market for inside information or something like that. Um, or, or just that if there's inside, you know, everything is to some extent inside information. If I read the newspaper and you don't, I have more information than you do. So if a, somebody has a lawyer at a law firm putting together a deal, he should trade the stock because then that conveys to me indirectly through the price of the stock that, oh, there's some unusual information that someone knows because the stock is moving in an unexpected way. So maybe I can take advantage of this. Mm -hmm. And then that could start to be statistically modeled and so on. So I, I'm, I'm in favor of a market should have information in it because it's going to be inside information traded anyway, regardless. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that, you know, this really <laughs> brings up to my mind, at least getting back to the, to the imposter syndrome. So then I was like, huh, this is kind of a cool question because I want to humanize my guests. So like someone like you, totally vulnerable, open, honest, will even say things that are super controversial on occasion. But then I have these like, really, and I keep making this joke. You got to help me come up with a better joke. But like, how do you know a scientist is, is an extrovert? He looks at your shoes when he talks to you. Of his. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Uh, I know it's a good one, but it, I got to, I got to, I've used it too many times, but, but then, so I started saying like one of the missions that I'm on is to like humanize scientists because a, people know about a scientist it's Michio Kaku, who's like super flamboyant, but you don't know anything about him. It's like, you know, uh, like Barack Obama's written four memoirs. It's, it's like he was a Nobel Prize winner. It means that we don't know much about him. Like there was still like information concealed. And what's called by physicists call this the surprise or entropy is related to like how much surprise do you get? Like I can tell you there's a box of gas and it has molecules, 10 to the 23rd molecules in random motion. That's a huge amount of entropy, but you don't learn anything and therefore you have no surprise. From, from getting that information. It doesn't do anything. You can't exploit that to do any useful work. But getting back to these really brilliant intellects that I get to talk to, in addition to talking about theories of everything and quantum gravity and like, you know, the existence of God, now I started asking them, are, do you ever suffer from the imposter syndrome? And I start noticing patterns and people that I would definitely predict would say that they don't have the imposter syndrome. They will say they don't have the imposter syndrome. Well, let me ask you this. What's the opposite of the imposter syndrome? I think it's it's like uh, it's a swagger, maybe like ego. Right. And so have you ever seen someone who's got, let's just take the complete extreme opposite. They have got complete swagger. It's not just ego, it's arrogance. Have you ever seen someone like that win the Nobel Prize? Oh, yes, many times. Really? Yeah, okay. it's actually, and actually getting back to what theory. you just said about- I, I take back my theory that <laughs> Nobel Prize winners always feel the imposter syndrome. So I, yeah, so no, no, they don't. No, no, I've had people on the show just this last week, Frank Wilczek from, and I did a live stream with him from MIT, and he's really interesting. But before I go to him, I want to put one thing back to what you said about insider trading. One of my guests, Shelley Glashow, he won the 1979 Nobel Prize for showing that electromagnetism- in what's called the weak nuclear force are two sides of the same Nobel medallion, so to speak. In other words, if you go to very early times in the universe, as we've been discussing, there's basically one force, and it's called the electroweak force. It's not called electromagnetism, which is what Maxwell unified. In other words, people used to think a magnet and an electron in a wire were two different, totally different things. But this guy, James Clerk Maxwell, showed, no, there's one overlying theory with a set of self-consistent equations. Only four equations are necessary. And they proved that electricity and magnetism are the same force. So he unified them together. And this is also related to what we were talking about earlier with gravity, that there's all these yes. similarities. So this Stop is it. why- I was just going to say that. Go ahead. All right, go ahead. No, you go ahead. No, you're getting your- that's You're the part, physicist. It's part of your, your universal GED, you know, graduate education degree. So it does seem like there is something we don't know. There's a known unknown that we don't know that is connecting all of these waves that we originally thought were different. And, you know, by the way, the same thing might occur when we start to understand time more. That maybe right. there's time waves that uh, that are also part of this uh, spectrum. But the problem that I'm getting is that uh, I'm getting a lot of this time it's the same. In other words, people are saying it worked for Maxwell in 1879. It worked for Sheldon Glashow in 1979. 
and it's going to work for Brian Ke- or Eric Weinstein or Julian Barber or you know or, or somebody else coming up when we unify gravity with the three higher energy forces. So that's the so-called theory of everything. You're absolutely right. The question, the, but the point is, there's no guarantee of that. And the fact that even Einstein went to his deathbed. Um, with an unrequited love and attempt to unify his theory of gravity with the theory of quantum mechanics, it doesn't ne- necessarily have to be so. So my kind of lone voice of, in the wilderness like Cassandra is crying out and saying, what if there is no way to unify these things together and we're looking at this all the wrong way? And some people are, are thinking in the same way. But, but I just want to get back to insider information because there's actually insider trading in physics that I learned about from this Nobel Prize winner named Sheldon Glashow. So he had uh, been working to do what um, uh, this, what the people, this Peter Higgs, and eventually this guy, other guys won the two guys won the Nobel Prize for the Higgs boson. He was slightly behind them, and he ended up winning a Nobel Prize on his own for a completely different theory. This electro weak, this unification of electricity with the nuclear force. It's totally paradoxical, counterintuitive, and he totally deserves the Nobel Prize for this. But in the meantime, he was kind of hot on the trail of what are called quarks, discovering quarks. You and I talked about this yeah. you know, three shows back. Quarks are thought to be the f- most elementary particle. They make up protons, and, and protons make up atoms. They make up protons and neutrons. And actually, people always say, oh, we're made of star stuff. Even I said that in my book. I said, yeah, you're made of star stuff. Actually, it's, it's, it's kind of more simple than that. One of my friends, he's a, G, a, PA, a professor of neurobiology here at UC San Diego, Gentry Patrick. He was actually on my show this past summer as well. And he and I were on a walk this weekend with our kids. And he's like, it's, isn't it amazing that the human genome is made up of just four different you know, uh, molecular compounds like G, C, T, and A in the DNA? And I said, I'm going to blow your mind because we're just made up of two types of quarks. We're made of an up quark and a down quark, and that's it. And and he was like, wow. And aren't like, there also like strange quarks and there's strange quarks, but they, they don't make up our body. Okay. You know, it's like it's like, yes, there's stuff called styrofoam, but it doesn't make up the a DNA or, or a genetic code. Okay. In other words, we the periodic table behind me over there, that's made up of 120 things plus isotopes and whatever. But if you reduce each one of those, you get a neutron and a proton. The neutrons and protons are just made up of up and down quarks. And if you want, you could throw in electrons. So there's basically only three components. Now, what people are trying to do is say, no, the quarks, just like the proton is made up of three quarks, a quark could be made up of a string. And that's the elementary, the most elementary thing. We don't know if that's true. That's been the quest for the last 40 years. The reason I bring this up is this guy, Murray Gelman at Caltech, he came up with the name quark, which comes from Finnegan's Wake. There's like... Uh, some sentence, three quarks for Mr. Mark or something in it. And he used that. He's like this really erudite, snobby kind of guy. One of the guys who didn't have imposter syndrome when he won the Nobel Prize, but it was like, what took you so long, sure. you know, <laughs> uh, when he won it. But, uh, but and, and uh, unfortunately he passed away about two years ago. But anyway, this guy, Shelley Glashow, who was on my show, did win the Nobel Prize. He had learned of the theory of quarks three years before any other physicist knew anything about it. So for three or four years, he was like publishing, you know, papers based on like, if three quarks exist, you know, whatever. And then those papers ended up getting him a tremendous amount of attention such that when he eventually won the Nobel Prize for something different, he had built up such a citation index, such a such a reputation in physics for like, wow, three years ago, you were talking about this thing that Murray Gell-Mann won the Nobel Prize for in 1969 or whatever. And you knew about like, whatever, you're so prescient. So he was trading in insider information and he admitted it. And he said, nothing feels as good as like, knowing a truth that nobody else believes to be to be real and you know it and i i just felt like that's insider trading right yeah i mean it's it's like running google for instance you know all this stuff behind the scenes like what are people searching for yeah right? you know all this data that nobody else knows it gives you and particularly when it's something super important they, there's this godlike feeling to it right but why would you want to keep something like that secret I think you want to pick as many low-hanging fruit, you know, as you can. And, you know, if you knew that if you were the only one that had the data for the Higgs boson or whatever, you'd study it. Just like Galileo. Galileo had the telescope. He wouldn't give it to his good buddy Kepler, 
who actually had the right notion and data to support the Copernican hypothesis that Galileo eventually got house imprisoned for not treating the Pope properly in his book, The Dialogue, which I'm doing a, a separate podcast about. And so for me, it was like, it was really exciting to think about, well, these physicists do the same thing as Galileo did. In other words, he had this telescope. Kepler kept saying, please give me one of your telescopes, sir. And he said, no, I'll give you this book and you could try to make your own, but the book has zero information. It's like, here's your instruction manual to assemble an iPhone, James. No, I want the freaking iPhone. Like, scientists want to preserve their monopoly every bit as much as a hedge fund trader, as Google does, et cetera, because we are storytellers. We want to be the first to tell the story because it'll allow us to tell it best. So it's interesting because ultimately, almost everybody we've mentioned has some degree of unhappiness. Like we talked about Barry Barish, that's incited this podcast, which is mm -hmm. his imposter syndrome. We talked about Jim Simons. We talked about, you know, Jerry, Gal Seinfeld. Jerry Seinfeld. Galileo was, you know, stingy about the information he was releasing. And I always feel that ultimately you have to have an abundance mindset. You have to avoid scarcity. So yeah. Galileo was feeling like, oh no, I'm not good enough because if I give Kepler my telescope, he's going to be better than me. And so it was really a, a feeling, it was a sense of insecurity that was the reason why Galileo didn't give Kepler the telescope. That's what it always is. That's right. Then you have to just take a step back. What are the components of, let's call it well-being. Happiness is a more second by second thing, but well-being is this general contentment with, with life that many of these people don't seem to be feeling. And it's a theory that the components of well-being are a sense of community, a sense of uh, freedom or autonomy and a sense of mastery that you're always improving at something. Would you include purpose? Like you have a mission, a broader mission, like Luke Skywalker or, or I don't know. I've had that discussion with some people maybe, but that also could be related to mastery. You're going to feel good mastering. You're going to be able to master something that you're passionate about. So when you're passionate about something, and I, I had this discussion with Stephen Kotler on my podcast, when you're passionate about something, you use less energy mastering it because it's not hard to deal with the inevitable frustrations of mastering something because you you're passionate about it you feel a sense of purpose about it so mastery is related to purpose so do you think these people are missing either community or mastery or autonomy well i think it's i think it's autonomy i think as you point out in a choose yourself the gatekeeper effect is real. And what's the ultimate gatekeeping mechanism in science? It's the Nobel Prize. You can't nominate yourself, as I learned when I was asked to nominate the winners in 2015. You can't nominate yourself, and that's like basically the only rule they adhere to uh, in Alfred Nobel's will, so to speak. So I think in that case, I interviewed a guy named Frank Wilczek, and he was one of these guys who I asked him, did you ever have imposter syndrome? And he said, no, I never have it. In fact, I sort of felt like I worked too hard in some ways, but not hard enough in other ways. And this is a guy who, imagine, uh, so he, uh, let's see if I can make the analogy appropriate. He invented this theory of quarks and how quarks should behave as a 22-year-old graduate student in 1973. Why did he invent quarks? Like, did he say, oh. He didn't invent quarks. He, he invented uh, a property of quarks. You, you never see a bare quark. You never see an up quark by itself. It's like a magnet. If you break a magnet in two, you don't get a north pole on one side and a south pole magnet on the other side. Even a horseshoe magnet, you get two north poles, a north and a south pole, and a north and a south pole. Uh, same thing with quarks. You can never rip them apart to just have an isolated quark, and that's called asymptotic freedom. And that's what he and his PhD advisor, uh, David Gross, devised in 1973 when he was a 21 or 22 year old. He did not win the Nobel Prize until 2004. So doing the math is over 31 years since he invented it to wait, knowing every day, everybody said, you're going to win the Nobel Prize. You're going to win the Nobel Prize. He said that was excruciating. Even a guy who has imposter syndrome and has no imposter syndrome, in other words, and has all the self-confidence in the world and it's deserved. It. He's this guy has like eight professional affiliations. They've started institutions just based on him. He's got a wonderful book coming out in a couple of weeks, and he'd be a great, a wonderful guest for you. He's a real mensch. He's one of the scientists also that can talk about anything from like medieval Islamic art to uh, Catholic, you know, doc dogma. But this guy has no imposter syndrome and yet was tortured by his own admission for 31 years of the prime years of his life. And in that period, he was coming up with new ideas and new theories, but that was the ultimate gatekeeper for him. It was the authority 
And he was an authority. So maybe I'm not answering the question properly, but he was kind of, uh, he let himself not, he didn't choose himself, right? No, you're, you're right. So he's basically outsourcing part of his freedom. And it's not his agency only, but his self-worth. Right. To, to this, basically this man-made institution of the Nobel Prize. Like that's- 300 Swedish guys. Yeah. Right. And, and just people around the world look towards the Nobel Prize to tell us who the greatest experts in history are. But this is just a man-made phenomenon. Like- we don't necessarily need that for anything. So you're right. So he outsourced part of his freedom to that. And so maybe the whole thing is being careful what institutions, real or ephemeral, we outsource part of our freedom to. It's not just, like you point out, it's not just humans. It's not just a boss or a publisher or whatever. It's it's ideas. It's like, I want people to respect me for something. I want to be, I might be a great hedge fund manager, but I want to also write a best-selling book and I won't be happy until people think I'm an intellectual of a book or whatever. Right. So one of my you know, book, many book ideas is I want to write a book you know, like finding the Nobel Prize or something, but for Jim Simons. In other words, like, what do you get the billionaire who has everything? Well, I got him an asteroid. Actually, there's an asteroid that I got named after him. I got an asteroid named after his wife, Marilyn Simons, who was my babysitter, changed my diapers and got her familiarity with dark matter at a young age. Uh, that uh, I got them asteroids, but that's not enough. I got to get him a Nobel Prize. So maybe I shouldn't say this, but, you know, I'm kind of like – I was I was joking the other day with Eric Weinstein, you know, like I'm recruiting all these uh, Nobel Prize winners to make a sleeper cell that will activate because you can nominate winners of the Nobel Prize after you win a Nobel Prize. Right, because there's no bias, really, supposedly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so you're actually like three times more likely to win a Nobel Prize if your colleague won a Nobel Prize or your PhD advisor won a Nobel Prize or your PhD student won a Nobel Prize. Uh, so I'm like, yeah, let me recruit all these sleeper cell members to activate at the right moment to nominate Jim Simons and overwhelmingly he should get it. But I just think, yeah, it's interesting. It does carry this tremendous, tremendous influence on humanity. And I think I, maybe I said this on, when I was on your podcast the first time, I kind of feel like people, like if there weren't no Jerry Seinfeld, it wouldn't be like, oh, we really want like some great comedian, you know, or, or whatever. Like, but I think people want there to be Nobel Prize winners. Like it makes yeah. them feel good that we as a species, you know, like there are no lemurs, you know, producing, you know, great scientific works. And it's not even about technology. Because as I said, LIGO, this gravity wave detector, can't do anything technical. It does nothing of any use to anybody in a practical sense. But you know what? We want lists. We want, we love lists. So we yes. want, who are the best scientists of all time? There was a book when I was a kid, uh, the hundred most influential people in history. Yeah. It was just this guy's opinion, but it was a best selling book. Everyone wanted to know who's the hundred most. And then there was arguments. Oh no, you can't put this guy here. He's here. Why wasn't this guy included or this woman or whatever? So we, we love lists. We also we outsource part of our freedom to to hierarchy because yeah. we're tribal animals. Like who's the alpha, who's the omega, and it's who's everybody in between? Right? right. I don't have to like like know what they all did. I just know the parameterization of their accomplishments. But like getting back to Barry Barish, mm -hmm. and this is related to everybody. Like I think about this: Can I ever do nothing, or will I literally will I think people won't like me if I'm doing nothing? If I just sit around every day and enjoy time with my wife and friends and do a crossword puzzle in the afternoon and maybe garden a little bit. Some people do that and they're very happy, but most people don't and are unhappy. I always hope I can get to a point where that will be enough for me, but I don't know if that's possible. I don't know if that's a bad thing or a good thing. I don't think it's a bad thing if it's productive. You know, if you're looking for ways to, you know, corner the market on, you know, smack in, in uh, South Florida or South New York or wherever you are. Yeah, I think that's not commendable. And actually, people like that could do, you know, I mean, people with this kind of disparate um, intellectually spectrum, you know, kind of uh, talents on a vast spectrum, rather, uh, they could do almost anything. Like, I, I know Barry Barish could go and, you know, help work on, uh, he, you know, for example, this guy, Lenny Susskind, who studies uh, the properties of black holes and at the quantum level, he's one of the advisors to Google X. And so he's like helping them, you know, whatever, in some algorithm or, or whatever they do. And this is a guy who has the imposter syndrome as well. And yet I think it's intellectually stimulating. I think I had this guy, Judd Brewer, who's a doctor, a PhD, MD, professor at Brown University. He wrote a book called The Craving Mind. And his point is that to quit like food addiction 
and he helped me with my food problem. I, I, he helped me drop five pounds actually from my double chin to my stomach. Mm -hmm. uh, but he, uh, but he says like, how do you hack the brain and mindfulness to engage uh, its its power to overcome addiction of smoking and eating? Just in those cases, or in my case, smoked meats. So that combines both of these addictions. Right. So he said, um, craving is a form of uh, can be overcome by curiosity. So curiosity releases a tiny bit of dopamine, right? When you win a chess or when you see the solution to a chess puzzle or when you start one of your mini chess puzzles you did live stream the other night, that's fun. That gives you a tiny dopamine hit. Forget about the podcasting aspect. Just like you sitting in a room by yourself going through like this uh, op opening, you know, book, a book of openings, Capablanca, whatever. You, it's, it gives you a little dopamine hit. And he says you can hack that by – why am I hungry right now? Is it really hunger? Is it some other emotion like James, you know, insulted my mother again? You know, or is it like I haven't eaten in four hours and I'm getting hangry as, I, as I'm or three hours or 15 minutes actually. Uh, but, you know, so get curious about that. Is it emotional eating? And then that will release something like, oh, well, that's interesting. Let me recognize, let me assess, let me investigate, let me note. And then by doing so, you can overcome this much more primitive lizard brain desire to eat and give into your addiction. But just, you know, and I always think that's somewhat true that awareness is the first step in solving the, a problem like an addiction. Like you could say to yourself, oh, whenever I'm in an unhappy state in my life, I start drinking an enormous amount of alcohol and self-sabotaging myself. So if you start drinking a lot, you would say, oh, I must be, something in my life must be making me unhappy. I don't know what it is. What could it be? But still you need that dopamine hit just because you know doesn't mean it doesn't exist anymore. The, right. the thing that's causing you the yeah. problem. Obviously, yeah. I mean, I you know literally have lost you know five pounds or something like that. Uh, I did give up my uh, crack smoking habit, but uh, that 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 would have. Oh, although I'm constantly wondering, all right, it, it's good that you gave up your crack smoking habit, just like Hunter Biden. But don't. <laughs> Where do people get crack now? Like it was like an '80s drug, and suddenly, like crack is in the newspaper. I know it's all over the news. I, I think, yeah. I mean, maybe they cornered the market. I, I don't know. Um, but yeah, no, I, I know it's right. And also, I feel like these everything like Weight Watchers shouldn't its job be to put itself out of business, like uh, you know, the, the, or, or like dentistry. Like dentists should try to work to to completely you know make themselves irrelevant. Uh, but in fact, they just you know do more and more upsells and upgrades. In other words, weight loss, you should just be like, here's the thing. And then, but obviously you can't. And so uh, I guess maybe the point is, yeah, maybe it's a little bit more individualized or something like that. I know that you can, like, for example, the imposter syndrome, like, well, okay, so that's kind of a blanket designation, but can you develop meta skills that will compensate, overcompensate, which I'm a big fan of overcompensation, right? So like I was going to give my TEDx talk, the one that you and I spoke at, years ago. And to overcompensate, I want to feel what it felt like to bomb on stage in front of a hostile strain audience of strangers, some of whom were likely to be drunk. So I went to the comedy store here in La Jolla. There's, I don't know why there's a comedy store in, in Los Angeles, very famous, and they have a San Diego branch in La Jolla. I didn't know that. So I performed there. I can say I performed at the comedy store. Yes. And I went there, open mic night. I was the last of 20 performers. I did my bit. I talked about that, I think, the first time I was on your show, or maybe the yeah. first time you were on my show, Into the Impossible. And I went up there, and I did a clean bit. All, no cursing. You know, my wife was there. My rabbi was in the audience. I didn't want to, like, curse and say the MF this and F you that and talk about my period again. Uh, but I went through, or how I missed a period for 45 years in a row. <laughs> but I went through it, and it felt really good to do the TED Talk. It was almost like a letdown. Now, I know you had a completely different experience with your TED Talk. You want, but imagine if you had like, like virtual reality TED like headset and you put it on and you're like, I'm going to feel this really strong urge to give into my addiction to abandon things that are stressful to James. Because you, you had a history of that and somehow you overcame it. Maybe it was just luck. I don't think you were like, whatever, in, you know, invoke some, some prayer to, to some higher authority that day. But you did it. And I feel like I do that with my students. So I know many of my students have the imposter syndrome. So what do I do? I force them to go give talks at universities to like professors, <laughs> you know, like I, even my students uh, that I have had foreign students, I send them to Toastmasters. So I've had students from China, students from Thailand. I say, you guys, your vocabulary is great, but your pronunciation needs some work. Why don't you go and go and tell jokes to people at Toastmasters and I'll pay for you to do it. And they come back and they're much better at giving a talk about the Higgs boson. Yeah, no, I think, 
I think doing something that's harder than what you're supposed to do and practicing that, it, it makes it, oh, this is easy. I just performed stand up in front of all these people. Now I'm giving a public talk in front of a group of my peers. That actually is trivial now compared to stand up. And in fact, that works. Like my public speaking has 10 X since starting stand up. But yeah, so maybe it's just like for him to overcome for Barry Barish to overcome imposter syndrome or for anybody, it's almost like he has to be curious really about maybe a different field uh, other than physics. You know, he's got to find a new frontier for himself because mm -hmm. then he won't care about being an imposter in physics. He's like, okay, I won the Nobel prize. Oh, what are you going to say to me? I won the Nobel prize. Now I'm more, now I feel an imposter about, you know, playing the violin because that's what I'm trying to get good at. Or I want to be a jazz pianist at a bar. And so that's what I feel imposter syndrome. All these people have been jazz pianists for 30 years and I'm just starting. And now here I am because I'm a Nobel prize winner. They let me play the jazz piano at a bar. Oh, we got a famous Nobel prize winner here. So now he feels imposter syndrome about something new. It's almost like he's got to transfer. Mm. He can't get rid of the imposter syndrome feeling. He's like that, addicted to the, the imposter syndrome. <laughs> right. And I think that's the thing. Like we're, we're, we're older. He's 80 years old, right? He's got this yeah. imposter syndrome muscle that he's been exercising for 80 years. He does, he's, he's, he's colorblind and he's trying to understand what the color red looks like. He doesn't know what, what it's like to be without imposter syndrome. That's what's driven him to some of his success. And so it's mm. almost like he needs to be, I agree with the guy that curiosity is important, but maybe now he has to be curious about a completely different field so he could kind of downgrade his imposter syndrome to something other than the Nobel Prize in physics. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm tra I am had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Maine clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Maine. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Maine dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've got very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts, our untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, Every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at mizzenandmain, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and main.com. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured, 
For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But People in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Memberships start at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one classes with all 180-plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180-plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So... This holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. And, you know, one of those uh, things that you're saying actually kind of brings true, which is why, why do you see all these theorists that, you know, like the Michio Kaku's and the, the Sheldon Glashow's and the Steven Weinberg's and the Albert Einstein's, why do they say that, like, have you ever heard that mathematicians do their best work before age 30? Like, actually, the Fields Medal, you can only win the Fields Medal if you're under age 40. Really? Yeah. So there's a saying like that. Uh, my father used to dispute that. He used to say, you have 10 years at some point in your life. Like, in other words, the clock will start, let's say you get your PhD at 30, you'll have 10 years. So it's not, 30 is not the hard cutoff. It's 10 years after you get your PhD. And I've always wondered why is that for people that study math or theoretical physics, but it's not true of experimentalists. In other words, there's some arbitrage opportunity that I feel exists. I actually had a big argument with Eric uh, Weinstein about this. I made the analogy that theory or you know, mathematics is cheap and abundant. And like you always tell me when you're reading one of my essays or something like, 
you know, supply and demand. Like the more supply there is, the less demand there'll be. So cut your essays down to the bare minimum, the guts of the bones of the thing, and that'll be. But um, in the case of, you know, people that are doing theory, there's so many theorists. It's so abundant. There's so many theories of everything. There's string theory. There's M theory. There's, you know, Eric has geometric unity. There's this guy E8 and Jar Garrett Lisi. There's like an abundance of theories of everything. So I started to joke, how come you don't see like all these experiments of everything? Because my contention is that like theory is like software. It has all the same problems. It, it can be, and I'm not denigrating programmers. I, I, some of my best friends are programmers, but like it's easier to write an iOS app than to build an iPhone. That's just a fact, right? I mean, like the number of people that it takes to build an iPhone is much different than the number of people it takes to build an app. I mean, you build apps. I've tried to build apps. I'm not that good at it. Um, and again, I'm not denigrating what they do. I'm just saying the supply of theory and the supply of theorems is much more abundant, uh, heavy side, supply side, than is the demand, which is a consumption, which are the experiments. But why would the best theories come about within 10 years of the PhD, for instance? I think you know, there's sort of this, uh, you know, it's like, why don't you see a lot of 80 year old coders? I, I don't know. It, it could be, there's this like period of intensity and like stand-up comedians there are very few that start as late as you. Uh, a lot of them will start younger and it takes them 20 years. I mean, Jerry's talks about starting when he was like 19 coming in the city. The only person I could think of like me is a uh, Rodney Dangerfield started in his forties. Oh, yeah. I think that's right. Yeah. Still uh, younger yeah. than me, but yeah. So I think there's there's a period of intensity that you have to work to the exclusion of everything else. So Einstein was a crappy father. He didn't take care of his wives, plural. You know, he divorced. He, he was like not me mentally abusive, they say to some. He didn't, uh, one of his kids was in an insane asylum. He never saw him after he was committed till the day the kid died. So like he worked, but he worked from age 25 to age, you know, 35, almost continuously to age 40. And then that was it, that he didn't have another good idea after, you know, that really panned out. He was kind of the elder statesman critic of stuff from age 40 till he died in the 70s. But, you know, this is where I, I you know, Einstein, we know him for like two or three theories, right? The theory yeah. of relativity and its various variations. Um, but I think... Wasn't his most cited paper from later in his life? You know, he wrote like something like 290 papers during his life, not three. So quantity actually is important, I think, for success is what they're starting to realize. Mm -hmm. But I think his most cited paper, and I'm trying to Google it now. Yeah, his most cited paper is can quantum mechanical description of physical reality be considered complete? Right. And that's from 1935, 30 yeah. years after his relativity work. Right, he's so, 55, yeah. So, so does that dispute the theory? Well, citations are not the same as, so that that paper is a critique, the so-called, you know, uh, this this EPR paradox that you can, instanta I can instantaneously determine what measurement, not what value, but what measurement you can do. So let, let's say you, you came from Florida and you're in New York. Um, you have uh, two pairs of socks. You've got a pair of red socks and a pair of blue socks. You open your suitcase and you packed and you find that you've got a, a pair of socks with one red sock and one blue sock. What do you instantly know about what you left behind in Florida? A red sock and a blue sock. Right. So you know exactly what Robin will find. But uh, she goes and looks through your stuff. Uh, as I assume all wives do. For my phone, my passwords, <laughs> got a keystroke logger on my computer. <laughs> That's right. So, um, and how fast does she know that? She knows that like instantaneously. Like as you can call her up on the phone and say, Robin, open the socks. I'm going to open up my socks. We're going to compare notes. And it goes, you know, if you have only red and she'll know she'll have only blue. That's not a quantum mechanical, but that's propagating information faster than the speed of light, right? Because you get it instantaneously yeah. at the same exact instance. You didn't have to tell her. You're going to find a red socket. But you can not only do that in quantum mechanics, but what Einstein called spooky action at a distance is in this paper on the completeness of quantum mechanics that is his highest cited paper. It's certainly not his most influential paper. And it certainly seems that Einstein was wrong in many things. One, one of the things that he was wrong about was that it was that this type of, of forced choice, you know, this lack of a loophole to explain that actually Robin could have discovered two red socks, you know, in the quantum mechanical realm. It's take too much time to get into. This paper, it actually, the, up, the upshot is that most people think Einstein is wrong. And it happens to be that, you know, that actually this spooky action at a distance is taking place at a certain level to speak sloppily. And there's many explanations why that is, but it's not his most important paper by a long shot. I see. So this again is related to then 
I, I believe though what you're saying about the 10 years, you look at like musical bands, the mm -hmm. Beatles, the, even Chess. the best bands in the world, you only could remember songs from their five to 10 year period, whether it's Led right. Zeppelin, U2, uh, the Beatles, maybe Bob Dylan, he made songs from like the early 60s to today. But you know what his the most recent song is about? No. It's like 17 minute song about a very topical event, the Kennedy assassination. <laughs> Yeah, see, and he even knows, he writes in his memoirs that, that around the 80s, he knows that he's not making music that's popular to anyone, but he just wants to make it. So, mm -hmm. so uh, you know, you only know songs of his from the 60s, and he's cool with that. Every band has to be cool with that. So my contention is, is that you've got to diversify the things you want to be good at in life so that every five to 10 years, you become, cu again, curious about something new and passionate about something new. I used to day trade and if I had a bad day and I was passionate about day trading, if I had a bad day, day trading, which is going to happen all the time, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, ruin your chess game, right? Well, I would switch to chess and play chess for the rest of the afternoon so that my, I would get my dopamine that way. And there was one point I remember in the early nineties, I was playing, I was unhappy at my job. I was unhappy with my relationship. I was, I was playing games all the time. And the only way I got free of that was the web was created and I started learning this new exciting thing that I got passionate about. So kind of like diversifying your passion so you you diversify what you're relevant in mm -hmm. uh is is it has been my solution for this. Um, and you get on the learning like I think maybe the curiosity thing that this guy Judd Brewer is talking about there's like a thrill of the learning curve is so steep in the beginning and it's yeah. so slow in the end. It's actually the exact opposite of the 1% rule. Do you know that uh, you quoted the 1% rule, which is awesome. You know, most people think it's 365% in a right. year or whatever. You debunk that. But you know it's actually 3,200% or so, right? Yeah, it's so, like 3,700%. So that means it's going to, let's say you prove 1% per day. Let's say you're trying to lose 10 pounds, okay? So you want to lose 10 pounds in a year, and you're going to do it 1% per day. So do you know that, like, in the first almost three months, you'll lose, like, 12 ounces, because that's 72. So every 72 days, you'll lose one half, but it has to go one yeah. half plus one quarter plus one third plus one, et cetera, till you get to 10 pounds. And you'll lose the last five pounds in the last doubling period, right? That's the way doubling periods work. So every doubling period, you get uh, everything that came before. So on the last doubling period, the last 72 days of the year, you'll lose all five pounds. That means in the first four doubling periods, you lose 12 ounces, you know, maybe 19 ounces, whatever. And, but like, can you imagine like you have one sip of, you know, one can of, of, of diets, Dr. Pepper, and like your whole weight loss for three months goes away. Right. But if you instead, you know, so it's kind of like the inverse learning curve, but then on the last days of, of the year, you're going to lose like tremendous amount every day or, or, you know, towards the end of that final period. And it's kind of like the opposite of the learning curve. Like the learning curve is very steep in the beginning and then it exponentially kind of tails off. And the uh, exponential growth curve or the logistic curve, that grows, you know, very slowly except at the very end. And I wonder, we love the periods of great growth, right? Yeah. We love the initial learning curve phase that you're just talking about where you get really excited about something, you learn, you double, learn. maybe they're inverses of each other. In other words, maybe it's like exponential decay in the case of learning curve. And that's why it feels so good. You get all the benefits up front and then the like 1% improvement towards the end takes, you know, half your life. Well, and, and also because you're not getting that same dopamine of the learning curve, you, you start to think about things like imposter syndrome and yeah. Oh, I'm feeling like I've got no purpose anymore in physics because I already won the Nobel. Like you start to get, yes. you know, you, you have more time and energy in your brain because you're not going through that steep curve with all the dopamine associated with it. Uh, you know, I had this conversation with Andrew Huberman from Stanford, who's a neuroscientist. You have to switch. You have to know when to switch from dopamine to serotonin. So serotonin mm -hmm. is the feeling of contentment as opposed to the feeling of excited anticipation. And wow. so you have to switch to serotonin like, okay, now I'm an, it's okay that I'm an elder statesman in physics and maybe some people like me, maybe some people don't, but I'm okay with it because I've got, I'm switching to serotonin. You almost have to consciously do that. Yeah, it's funny. It's like, I was joking. One of my friends had her, her like second baby and I'm like, thanks to oxytocin, you know, like, like no woman would have another baby after the first one. Like if they didn't get the uh, oxytocin hit, <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, the dopamine feels good in the, for the guy, you know, when he's participating in it. But it's funny. Cause I, I'm trying to get Galileo's dialogue 
the audiobook done for the first time. It's owned, the rights are owned by the University of California. And I'm trying just to publish it as an audiobook. This is one of the greatest books in human history, in scientific history, and even in it's called one of the greatest popular science books of all time, right after losing the Nobel Prize. <laughs> and uh, and in it, Galileo talks about some of these psychological bias effects. And he talks about like the imposter syndrome effectively in the Dunning Kruger effect. He says, the vain presumption of understanding everything can have no other basis than never understanding anything. In other words, he's saying you're vain, you're like, you're, you're deluding yourself if you think you understand everything. And it's because you don't understand anything. He says, for anyone who had experienced just once the perfect understanding of one single thing and had truly tasted how knowledge is accomplished, he would recognize that of the infinity of other truths, he understands nothing. And I think this applies to this guy, Barry Barish, right? He understood one thing really well. And now he knows, like, he picked up this pebble. You know, Newton used to say, like, I'm but a boy on the seashore picking up a pebble and looking at it and then ignoring the ocean of unsolved truths in front of me. <laughs> but this guy, maybe he, the imposter syndrome is a symptom or a byproduct of understanding one thing really well and then realizing, I don't understand most of the universe. Right. And then, and not only that, the more passionate you are about something, the more you're going to feel imposter syndrome because you're going to know more and more of the nuances of what's happening. You know, someone who has Dunning-Kruger effect, um, which means, you know, you, you think you know more than you do, particularly in the begin when you're a novice and you're just on the beginning of that learning curve and you're learning so much, you figure, oh my gosh, I'm smart now in this because I'm learning so fast. It's like almost the opposite of imposter syndrome. But when you're, again, uh, after the Dunning-Kruger effect, after the learning curve, now you realize all the nuances of the field of course, you're going to feel like an imposter. Of course, that's why, again, I'm kind of circling around the solution of diversifying the things you're curious about, not just understanding the source of uh, why, your dopamine addiction, but legitimately being passionate about something else. So if someone runs up to you and says, hey, Dr. Barish, look at my new physics idea, you could say to yourself, a, you could be encouraging to this person and help that person's career, and B, because you're going to get back to your gardening later, which is now what you're passionate about, <laughs> and you're you're going to a, a dinner of all the best gardeners in the world, and you can't wait for that. So you're willing to help this guy win the Nobel Prize also, and because you know your real interest now is gardening, yeah. and I, and I think that's that's why I always like to sometimes it's too much, but I like to juggle multiple things so I don't outsource my freedom. I'm piecing it all together. But I don't outsource my freedom to some artificial institution because I can put all your cosmic eggs in one multiverse yeah. basket. Which is why, you know, I'm getting my PhD in podcast physics here because I'm correspondent school PhD. Yeah. Right. Like we, like we never get to the actual episode, but that's okay. No, no, <laughs> but this we talked about a lot of things relevant to uh the the, yeah, the Big Bang there. True. And yeah. look, my the the stock I own the most shares of went down today. So I was able to ignore it while I engaged in podcast physics. You know, that's been so interesting to me because like now I used to be kind of like Twitter addicted. Like I check on Twitter. Do I have any followers? Do I have any likes? But now it's like, okay, so now I've got podcast reviews, you know, and how many podcast reviews can I get? So I'm going to encourage people to review the James Altucher show. There's a theme in Judaism that if you want something for yourself, let's say you want to have kids or you want to get married or you want to get divorced, uh, you pray for somebody else to get those. So I am praying my sincere early Hanukkah prayer for James Altucher is that you double the number of reviews and downloads, subscribes, uh, et cetera, for the James Altucher show. And I will pray the same for you as well, that your podcast gets to Joe Rogan Heights and you're offered a $100 million Spotify deal. That would be the best thing that could happen. <laughs> From your lips to God's <laughs> headphones. Thank you, James. Yeah, thank you, Brian. And, um, you get imposter syndrome, at least win the Nobel Prize with it. That's our <laughs> That's conclusion. <right. laughs> the McNugget Buddies are back. But this time, they got a fresh look as part of the new Kerwin Frost Box at McDonald's. We're talking all new buddies, dressed head to toe in the freshest fits. All designed by the artist Kerwin Frost. So when you order the Kerwin Frost box with your choice of 10-piece McNuggets or a Big Mac, you'll get one of the flyest McNugget buddies to go with it. Think you can collect them all? Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. I'm loving it. At participating McDonald's for a limited time, while supplies last, 